I fell in love with mathematics uh, at school when my teacher explained to me that what this subject is all about is actually is something he liked to call the art of the shortcut. So what I wanted to do was to give you this perspective that my teacher gave me um, about why mathematics is so amazing because it's basically the best collection of shortcuts that we've gathered over our kind of 2,000, 3,000 years of exploring mathematics. I think another reason I fell in love with maths is because I loved solving puzzles. Uh, the idea of having a puzzle, um, and there's clearly a very stupid way to do puzzles quite often, um, but the real joy is finding that clever way of thinking about the problem, what I call the shortcut, and then the whole thing just falls apart. And you go, oh, that's, that's so I understand this now. So here, here's the little puzzle, and, and maybe we'll solve this at the, the end of uh, the video. So you're a grocer and you've got one of those um, scales, balance scales, so you can put things on either side. And you want to be able to weigh things from one kilogram up to 40 kilograms, just whole number units. What is the smallest number of weights you can get away with? So, you know, what's the shortcut for the grocer in not having to buy, you know, weights from one to 40? That's obviously, you could do 40, um, but what is the smallest number you can get away with? So we have to be able to cover every integer, presumably, not, not, exactly. not 0.7. And... No, I don't want 0.7. So I just, you, you want from one, two, three, all the way up to 40. Um, and so re remember, you can put weights on either side. You're gonna be using that fact to sort of cut down uh, the number you need. Actually, the problem that caught my imagination when I was at school, and it's a problem, uh, you've probably done a number file on it, that moment when Gauss at school was asked to add the numbers up from one to a hundred. And the story goes is the teacher who challenged the class with this problem was hoping to get a, a little bit of rest because he knew this would take a long time. One plus two plus three. And sure enough, all the other students started doing their arithmetic but almost before the teacher could finish with a challenge, Gauss had put down his blackboard with the answer on. You know, how did he manage to find a shortcut to doing this huge amount of work of adding up numbers? And, you know, the, the lovely shortcut is he spotted a pattern, which is if you add the numbers 1 plus 100, 2 plus 99, 3 plus 98, they're all 101, and you've got 50 of these pairs, and so you've just got 50 lots of 101. 5,050. And I think this beautifully illustrated for me the power of mathematical thought as a shortcut. First of all, you, you've just um, cut out just having to do a huge slog of, of hard work, uh, one, up, one up to 100. But it, the beauty of this shortcut, again, is that it, it works however big the number. If the teacher had said count up to a million, the same trick works. And, and I think for me that was just so exciting. I think it sort of appealed to me as a lazy teenager that I didn't want to do a lot of hard work. Um, I, uh, the idea of learning this uh, kind of skill set of, of shortcuts, um, uh, and that's actually what I've been doing over uh, the last few months, is sort of gathering in a book uh, the idea of different shortcuts that we have in mathematics. And, and I think one of them is pattern searching, which is the one that Gauss was using. But there's a kind of funny paradox here, because although I think I actually was drawn to shortcuts because I was a bit lazy as, at school and I liked the idea that if I thought cleverly, I could get through to the answer really quickly and then I could go and play football. Actually, in my professional life as a mathematician, finding shortcuts, finding those shortcuts can take a very long time. Um, so you're kind of stuck in front of this wall and you just don't know what to do. But that's actually the joy and it taps into that idea of a puzzle. The best puzzles are the one that you wrestle with for ages and then, you get it. So I think the shortcuts that we've come up with um, throughout the history of mathematics, one has to remember that mathematicians have spent a long time coming up with these shortcuts that now we teach at school and university. We've made the tunnel through the mountain um, and that's what I hope, you know, we, we communicate. But I think it's a sort of new perspective. I don't think people think of um, uh, mathematics as kind of like the art of the shortcut. I imagine a lot of the things I learned at high school when I was learning mathematics that are considered, you know, the tools of mathematics are in fact shortcuts that have just become so standardised that we just think that's what mathematics is. 
Yes, I mean, so I think, you know, algebra is a shortcut to not having to do individual calculations on, on each numbers. It's spotting the underlying pattern. But I think some of my favorite shortcuts, ones we've made number files about, but one of my favorite is Euler's kind of solution to why the bridges of Königsberg can't be uh, crossed. So, you know, we're all brought up on this story as a kind of mathematical fairy tale. <laughs> the seven bridges crossing the river Pragel, the residents in Königsberg, Sunday afternoon, they try and cross it. And again, here's the hard work. How would you show that you can't cross these? Well, you've got to do all the possibilities. That's going to take forever. Well, not forever, but a long time. The beauty of Euler's shortcut is once he's drawn the network and, and understood that each node in this network of bridges, there can be either zero or two places with an odd number of bridges coming out. If there are two, that's the beginning and the end of the journey, but everywhere else, you're going in and out on different bridges. So you've got an even number. That's inspired because, you know, now I can draw an incredibly complicated network, but using this shortcut, all I need to do is to count the number of vertices with odd number of bridges coming out of it. And I know whether it is navigable or not. And there's an interesting, uh, I mean, Brady, you, you, you live near Bristol, so um, uh, you've got a lot of bridges around Bristol. And in fact, somebody's analysed, um, I think it's in the region of like 40, 50 bridges. Now, that's quite a complicated network. But he was able to spot, using this Euler shortcut, OK, this is possible. And, and so he actually did it. I think it took over a day to, to travel all of these bridges. But he knew at the outset that he'd be, he'd be able to do it. There's a nice little coda to this story because I actually went to Königsberg. It's now called Kaliningrad. It's a small little enclave or exclave, I think it's uh, because it's separate from Russia, surrounded by other countries. But I actually discovered there are still seven bridges, but they're arranged in a completely different configuration. There's a, a railway bridge you can cross. And there's a dual carriageway. If you draw the diagram now, there are two places where an odd number of bridges come in and out. So when I went to Kaliningrad, I actually walked the seven bridges of Kaliningrad, although the shortcut told me I'd never be able to do the ones of Königsberg. Are there lots of tourists there doing that? Is that a thing you do there? Or is, that, or is it just two or three mathematicians a month for? I, I, I think that it, I was probably the only one uh, on that day scampering around Kaliningrad, which is quite a grim city, actually. Um, but I loved it. It was like visiting mathematical Disneyland. Professor, when, you, when a big new proof comes out, Fermat's last theorem or some of the big ones, is a common thread through those things that the, that the genius discovered a shortcut? Or sometimes is the way to a proof... There was no shortcut. You had to, you know, really push through. Uh, this is a really interesting question because it came up in, in my kind of analysis of this. Sort of sometimes, actually, you need to take a detour to sort of find your way through. And, and sometimes that detour will be as exciting as the shortcut. And I don't think Fermat's last theorem, had we found something that could fit in the margin, of course, it wouldn't have had the same kind of value to us that it has today because it was such a grand challenge. But on the other hand, if you look at that journey, a long journey that was made over 350 years, absolutely there are moments of shortcuts where suddenly you realise, oh, I found a passage from this equation of Fermat's through to a completely different land. That, you know, the modular forms. Uh, now I have to understand something about elliptic curves and modular forms. That was the ultimate shortcut because it was almost like finding a tunnel to a completely different area. And I think in, in my research, that's often what I'm looking for is those sneaky tunnels which take me from a problem coached in one sort of language and then turning it into something else where actually there's the tools to answer the problem. Is there a danger to shortcuts? If you Do they become a crutch? And if you always take the shortcut, could you miss that thing that no one had seen before? Well, I, for me, I think the danger of shortcuts is when does it become cutting corners? And I think this is a real, uh, this is a real challenge because very often in mathematics, what we try and do is throw away information which isn't important. You know, it, it wasn't important, the geometry of Königsberg. What was important was the, the way it was connected together. And, um, you know, one of the powerful shortcuts we come out with, not just in mathematics, but also uh, across the sciences, is the power of a diagram. If you think about physicists and chemists, their, their blackboards are covered in all these strange little you know, letters with lines coming out of them. That's a molecule, but um, it's a diagram of a molecule. The DNA spiral 
you, you couldn't put all the detail of the DNA, but they, they, they crystallized what was important about this um, uh, double helix. So I think that is a really powerful one. And again, in a way, networks are tapping into topology is about connectivity. London Underground map is not a, a physical map. You've thrown away things. The challenge is making sure you don't throw away too much. Um, and that's, I think, interesting when it comes to our incredibly data-rich world. Um, how do we navigate through this incredible jungle of numbers? And again, mathematics has come up with some extraordinary shortcuts to, to find our way through understanding what is happening in those numbers. But again, you need to be careful. There's a chance that you might have missed some signal inside of there. And there was this advert when I was a kid um, about cat food, Whiskers cat food. And it, it, it kind of said very grandly, eight out of 10 cats prefer Whiskers. And, and we had a cat and I don't remember anybody ever coming around and asking our cat, oh, so which cat food do you eat, sir? And I, I was always perplexed by this. So how many cats did they actually ask? Um, there are about 7 million cats in the UK. Uh, how many have you got to ask in order to be able to make such a claim? Um, so that again is about how much can I throw away to, to really be justified in making that claim. And again, mathematics shows you that provided you're, um, you know, 5% error either way, we'll, 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 we'll take that, but that still isn't good enough because, well, does that mean I've got to ask 95% of that 7 million? No, but we also do this thing about, I don't mind, provided that 19 out of 20 times I will be getting within 5%. If you set that as your bar of your shortcut, you can get away with about 250 cats. That's extraordinary. I mean, that's the power of a shortcut in when you're trying to navigate data. Suddenly, I only have to talk to 250 cats and I can know pretty accurately you know, 19 out of 20 times, that will be within 5% of what the actual value is. It's pretty amazing if you can talk to even one cat, to be honest. But I, I suppose you're right. Yeah. <laughs> when one hears the word shortcut, one of the things that comes to your head is being a bit sloppy or finding a, a quick and dirty way of doing things. But we also know that mathematics is all about this sort of this rigor and this perfection, this unbreakability. Presumably when you use the word shortcut, you're not using it the way I would, like, you know, hanging a picture a bit wonky on a nail on a wall. Exactly. I think this is a really important point to stress that I'm after something which still gets me um, absolutely robustly to a solution. Um, I don't want something that's going to fall to pieces a little bit later. So, so this is a distinction between shortcuts and cutting corners. But, you know, there are times when it is about what is unnecessary work that I don't need to do, um, which is not really contributing to understanding it. it's just creating a sort of fog around here and I can uh, take that away. So uh, part of it is about, you know, what can I throw away and still I'm going to get to, to the solution. One of the rather extraordinary things is that, you know, mathematics is very good about talking about itself. I mean, I've done a number file about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, the power of mathematical equations to talk about itself. Mathematics is also able to analyze itself and tell us when there are no shortcuts. So sometimes it's important to know, okay, I can't get away without doing a huge amount of work in this particular case. And so people have probably heard of the traveling salesman problem. This is a challenge about trying to visit every city in a network in the shortest distance possible. And we now think that there is no clever algorithm to being able to solve this problem. And that's one of the millennial problems. One of our greatest challenges is to prove there are no shortcuts. But that's what mathematics is very good at that in showing why you cannot get away with doing something quickly. Unlike Euler's very clever trick for Königsberg, you don't have to navigate the whole of the network to know something's possible or impossible. We think that in order to find the shortest route, that mathematics will ultimately tell us there is no shortcut. So this is um, one called uh, P versus NP. So P, actually, for polynomial time, those are the kind of shortcut algorithms. Those are the ones that when you run them, it doesn't matter how big they get, it still uh, finds you the solution quickly. So the other problems uh, are, are ones where actually the algorithms that we have um, explode as the problem gets bigger. Um, but they have this quality that if you do find uh, the solution, it's almost like a needle in a haystack. You can't find it, but as soon as you put your finger on it, Wow, you feel it. So, um, so you can check these things very quickly. 
Traveling salesman problem is the classic one, but it's extraordinary how many other problems um, have this quality. And again, here's a shortcut. Amazing thing that we've discovered is that all of these NP problems, if you find a shortcut for one of them, that shortcut works for all of them. That's extraordinary. So, you know, one shortcut solves them all, sort of kind of Tolkien-esque. So that's also, you know, the, the power of showing, you know, once you solve one problem, you've solved loads of problems is something mathematics loves. Is this unique to mathematics? Like, does, does it work for chemistry and physics and biology or is it, is it a more of a mathy thing? I was quite intrigued to see whether other professions actually had their own shortcuts and, and what sort of things, uh, you know, my life feels like I'm try always trying to find the shortcut. What, what can you not get away with? Uh, shortcutting. So, so actually as part of this project, I've talked to a lot of people in other professions, for example, an international cellist. Can you get away from, I mean, I, I play the, the cello here, you know, I was quite intrigued. Can I shortcut being able to become a really great cellist playing those Bach suites? So I talked to Natalie Klein, an international cellist, and she really explained, actually, well, you're having to physically change your body. You know, as you practice, you sort of uh, you're trying to get that muscle memory, so you almost don't have to think. That is ultimately a shortcut, but that requires a lot of time practicing. So I think anything that requires physically changing your body, like becoming an international cellist or an athlete, um, it's very difficult to to shortcut that sort of physical um, change. So that was interesting. But there were other cases. Uh, for example, I talked to Brent Hoberman, um, who was the creator of, of LastMinute.com. And he's done wonderful startups. So it's kind of intriguing. What's your secret? Do you have a shortcut to startups? And he said, actually, it's, it's flying a little bit close to the, to the law. You know, you want to break things a little bit to, um, to make progress. And actually, that resonated with me with another sort of shortcut, um, which is the invention of imaginary numbers. We kind of broke a rule there, which, you know, square, and you were square numbers there, positive. Um, but what an amazing shortcut that provided. And, you know, there's a very famous uh, quote by um, a French mathematician about, you know, the shortest path between two real things is to go through the complex domain. So this is almost like a, a wormhole very often. If you can get complex numbers in there, radar, for example, you could do it just with real numbers, but it's a huge mess. As soon as you put it into complex numbers, the thing becomes very straightforward. In fact, I went to uh, visit a... Uh, um, air traffic control and and the people sitting there were saying you know we, we wouldn't be able to land these planes in time if we hadn't used the shortcut of uh, breaking that rule that every number is positive so, so that was interesting there are kind of resonances with other professions that are similar to to shortcuts that i've learned as a professional mathematician i like that can't land planes without complex numbers yeah <laughs> I think we should solve the problem. Yes, go on then. So there's a shortcut to solve this, is there? There is a shortcut because if you try and solve this problem, it's quite nice because you can try out uh, various different numbers. You might try powers of two. You might try just experimenting, see what it's doing. I mean, it's interesting. I wonder how many weights you would have got down to with that kind of experimental uh, approach um, because it's quite surprising. What you can do is to get away with the following weights. One, three, nine, and 27. Four weights. I think a lot of people will get down to five weights, but I actually see that you can get away with four weights um, it, it is quite extraordinary. And, and why? Well, you've probably noticed those are powers of three. So um, some of you might have tried binary uh, powers of two, but you've got a, um, an extra thing you can take advantage of here, which is these are balance scales. So you can put nothing on one side, one weight on one side, or kind of the negative of that weight on the other side. So in a way, you're building a number. We want to get the numbers from 1 to 40 using either 0, 1, or minus 1. So we're actually working with ternary numbers. Um, and so powers of 3 are going to be able to, to weight every number from 1 to 40. If you enjoyed this video, there's a fair chance you'll enjoy Marcus's new book, Thinking Better, The Art of the Shortcut. It's already getting some good reviews and I'm going to put a link to it in the video description so you can get your hands on a copy. I'll also put a link to Marcus's recent appearance on the Number File podcast. So he just took 101 and times it by 50 and he got 5,050. So this story was first written about in an obituary by one of Carl Gauss's friends.